um hello and uh, welcome to this session for the advanced financial management which is uh, previously the paper p4 uh, myself uh, lokman rafiq uh, i have uh, uh, actually been uh, conducting this uh, paper p4 webinar for acca for some time now in fact this is the third time that i shall actually be conducting this webinar so welcome you all and we hope that uh, we are actually going to have a very good session inshallah uh in which uh, we are going to have uh, a very detailed uh, uh, go through of few of the very important exam papers of the paper p4 <clears throat> there are actually few students who are uh, asking some questions so please wait for some time and uh, what i'm actually going to do is that i'm going to answer each and every question uh, of you people so basically basically the thing is that uh, i'm going to give you a brief introduction about myself that who am i and uh, at the same time i'm going to be discussing that uh, what exactly are going to be the things that we'll be discussing during this webinar session so as i discuss myself uh, lokman rafiq i serve as the chief executive of a uh, uh, acc gold uh, learning partner named scriber college of advanced studies and uh, at the same time i've been teaching for the last 10 years now uh, the various qualifications that i've been teaching uh, include acca ICAW CIMA and the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Pakistan these are the various qualifications that I have actually taught over a period of time now uh, at the same time um, my areas of expertise have been that uh, I have been teaching for some time the areas of financial management financial reporting and at the same time audit these are the areas that I have actually been teaching uh, if you move a bit further <clears throat> so if i could actually have a quick uh, a uh, discussion or the introduction about this paper p4 so basically the paper uh, advanced financial management i'm sorry i actually continue to use the word p4 but it's going to take us some time to actually get rid of the p4 from our uh, uh, from our uh, regular uh, usage so it's basically there is a linkage as you could see this graph that there is actually a linkage between this paper advanced financial management and uh, three other papers so which is actually ma the f2 paper then there is this uh, f9 the financial management then there is this uh, afm connection and we also see a connection between the strategic business leader and the afm and what exactly is that connection so you do study a lot of things at the paper uh, af in the strategic business leader like for example we do study various sort of theories we did we do discuss the internal analysis external analysis so all of those analysis the internal external etc they're actually uh, they're actually applied at this uh, afm level in some way or the other so we are actually this is just a brief introduction about how this afm paper is actually organized and then the main capabilities that you are expected to have when you actually attempt this paper so the main capabilities are actually uh, uh, the main capabilities are actually uh these which is uh, the role of the senior financial advisor the advanced investment appraisal the acquisition mergers corporate reconstruction reorganization and also the treasury and the advanced risk management technique so the core areas of these labors are actually the investment appraisal mergers acquisition corporate reconstruction and the treasury these four blocks which is the b c d and e are the main important areas of the syllabus <clears throat> so i've actually listed down few of the key key topics that are actually there in this uh, syllabus the reconstruction and the reorganization then there is this investment appraisal the acquisition mergers and the risk management so these are the four major areas of the syllabus the exam format uh, the exam format has now changed uh, since september the exam format is now such that uh, you've got question number 1 which is worth 50 marks and then you've got subsequent questions which are actually uh, uh, which are actually 25 marks each the question number 2 and the question number 3 what i'm actually going to go through is i'm going to go through few of the examiner comments from the recent uh, exam attempts and these uh, comments can actually give you a better idea about what the examiner is expecting out of you people so if i could actually just have a quick discussion about the various things that the examiner has actually uh, discussed over a period of time 
so these are number one the students uh, the number one of them is basically examiner insists upon attempting all three questions what he does is that he insists upon that the student should actually attempt all three questions now the next situation is basically he says that the students have actually struggled in the discursive uh, element uh, I'm actually going to discuss this point. A lot of his students actually think of paper advanced financial management as a paper in which only the computational aspects need to be followed. So it's actually not like this that you will follow the computational aspect. You need to go through the discursive element also, and that constitutes a significant part of the slavers. Then we have the application of knowledge to the scenario. The students actually, they don't apply the knowledge. They don't relate the knowledge to the scenario. Then you need to discuss and evaluate the circumstances uh, which are discussed in the question. So it has to be the examiner wants to see that you do have a proper understanding of the scenario that you are actually attempting. Because if you actually sound like as if you are giving a general, uh, if you are throwing away your general knowledge, your general knowledge about the subject, then the examiner is actually going to uh, be not happy with this. Then there's this something with the examiner says is that there are a lot of areas where you will have to exercise your professional judgment. So be very ready for that and at the same time since this is almost the final stage of the ACCA you are actually going to become an ACCA immediately after this uh, paper. So basically the examiner uh, expects that uh, as a student you would be able to uh, read quickly you will be able to digest all the information quickly. You should understand that how to prioritize the task then another one of them is basically that uh, the time management should be such that you'll be able to attempt all the questions and uh, ensure that uh, ensure that you just don't restrain yourself to the things that are available in the scenario you can give some out of the box solutions also so this is also what the examiner is actually expecting from us so these are few of the examiner comments which the examiner has actually marked out that which he expects the student to demonstrate the student wants to pass wants to achieve a pass in this question <laughs> Okay, so uh, these are actually few things that I discussed went through with respect to uh, the general comments. Now, since this uh, session is actually going to be an exam focused session, uh, because the point is that uh, the ACC has actually can uh, launch these sessions uh, in order to ensure that the students actually get a good exam practice. So, our major focus in this area is going to be mainly uh, the exam practice so our major focus is going to be the exam practice what we are actually going to be doing is we will actually be so as i did discuss that the exam practice is what the acc actually uh, has an objective of conducting this session so my own focus is also going to be on the exam practice now what is actually going to happen is uh, since we've got limited amount of time, which is actually going to be only 10 hours over a period of four days So we need to ensure that these four days these 10 hours are used as effectively as possible So what I'm actually going to do is that I would try and reduce the time that we actually do uh, For the basis of uh, the break in fact I would try that I should not take any break because there is as such no prayer break that we would actually be needing in these sessions the reason being that uh, there is no prayer uh, whose time is going to get over so we would probably try and uh, not take any breaks during the session now so <clears throat> first of all what we are actually going to do is we're going to start off with a question and this is actually a question from uh, the march june 2008 this is actually a question from march june 2008 18 March June 2018 uh, it is actually question number two and the name of the question is uh, Tipletine company the name of the question is Tipletine company so what I would actually suggest you all people is actually you open up this question so as I said that this is March June 2018 what is it it is March June 2018 Now let's have a discussion about this uh, question. So what we are actually going to do is that we are going to actually go through the question and we're going to keep on uh, discussing about the things. So first of all is 
basically what I would want is if you people could uh, uh, understand that how do we actually go through a question in any exam scenario. Now usually the P4 question or the advanced financial management question tend to be a bit on the lengthier side. So it is always advisable. It is always advisable that what you should do is that you should try and actually read the top paragraph and you should try and read the top paragraph and go to the questions requirement immediately. So if I actually refer to the requirement of this question, the first one of them is basically it says Triptyline is based in Valley Land. What is it based in? It's actually based in Valley Land. It is listed on Valley Land's stock exchange. The company is actually a listed company. But only has a small number of shareholders. So that means the shareholders are actually very few. So a small number of shareholders, its directors collectively own 45% of the equity share capital. So that means 45% of it is actually owned by the directors, which means that the external stakeholders are lesser in numbers. Now, the company's growth has been based on the manufacture of household electrical goods. However, the directors have taken a strategic decision to diversify operations and to make a major investment in facilities for the manufacture of office equipment. Now you see what happens is the company has been focusing upon the household electrical goods up till now. But now what are the directors trying to do is that they're trying to diversify and they want to get into this office equipment. So that means this is specific scenario. The examiner is actually focusing upon potential diversification. He's actually focusing upon potential diversification on the part of the directors. Now what next is there? It says the details of the investment. So what we are going to do is that we are going to discuss the details of the investment. But first of all, what we need to do is that we need to go to the requirements of the question that what exactly are the requirements of this question and uh, then we can actually move forward. Okay, so it says uh, calculate the adjusted present value. The question says calculate the adjusted present value, which is the APV for the investment on the basis that it is financed by the subsidized loan for the investment on the basis that it is financed by the subsidized loan and conclude whether the project should be accepted or not. Show all relevant calculations. Now, this is a 17 mark question, which is actually based upon the adjusted present value a 17 mark question on the adjusted present value now let's have a discussion about this adjusted present value as a technique that what exactly do we do when we actually go about with the adjusted present value okay there are students who are asking various questions so what i'm actually going to do is that i'm going to take uh, i'm going to focus on the question right now and if there are any specific questions pertaining to this question then i'm going to answer them but the other questions I'm going to answer once I'm done with this question. So now one of the requirement of the question is it says calculate the adjusted present value for the investment on the basis that it is financed by the subsidized loan. That's the number one thing. The number two thing that we are required to do is that we're required to discuss the issues which typically in shareholders who are not directors would consider if its director decided that new investment should be financed by the issue of convertible loan notes on the term suggested. It says you're not required to carry out any calculations in answering part B. Now this is very important. The instructions that the examiner gives in addition to the normal question, they do need, you do need to follow them. You need to ensure that you follow them properly and you need to ensure that you implement them uh, while you're attempting the question. Now, if I could actually have a quick discussion about the adjusted present value of the technique. So let's actually discuss that. How do we actually implement the adjusted present value as a technique? Okay, so when we talk about the concept of adjusted present value, what is this adjusted present value? <clears throat> adjusted present value is a technique which is actually a modified technique as compared to the net present value technique. And if I do discuss about the adjusted present value of the technique, so what we do when we talk about adjusted present value is that we say that the APV is basically the base case NPV. APV is base case NPV minus the present value of financing side effects. 
minus the present value of financing side effects. So when we talk about the APV, so APV, the adjusted present value is the base case NPV less the present value of the financing side effects. Now, what exactly do you mean by the base case NPV? So base case NPV is the NPV calculated on assumption that project is 100% equity funded. So it's an NP calculated on the assumption that the project is 100% equity funded. So what is it based on? It's calculated on the assumption that the project is 100% equity funded. And then you have got present value of financing side effects. Now what exactly do you mean by present value of financing side effects? So when we talk about the concept of present value of financing side effects, the present value of financing side effects actually refers to that the way you are going to finance this project that may be through loans that may be through equity etc so whatever the effect of that financing are going to be okay my 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 uh, rectification its present value of financing side effects needs to be added up not minus uh, thank you amartya thank you amartya that was an error on my part now anyways so whatever you finance using loans equity or whatsoever you need to actually add that impact now let's talk so basically it's an npv calculated on the assumption that the entity is 100 percent equity funded and there is this present value of financing side effects so what we're going to do is that when we are actually going to be attempting the question so we are going to identify that what are the factors to be used in base case npv and what is going to be used for the present value of financing side effects Now let's talk. Okay, now see. The question says the new investment is being appraised over a four year lifetime, four year time horizon. That means the project has a life of four years. Uh, revenues from the new investment are uncertain and the Tiplitin teen company's director has prepared that she regards as cautious forecast. She predicts that it will generate $2 million operating cash flow before marketing costs, before the marketing costs in year one, 14.5 million operating cash flows before marketing costs in year two, with operating cash flows rising by expected levels of inflation in year three and four. So we do have year one and we do have year two cash flows and then year three and year four they are actually going to increase with the inflationary adjustment. It says the marketing costs are predicted to be nine million dollar in year one and two million in each of the year two to four. So the operating cash flows are expected to rise with the inflation but there is nothing mentioned about the marketing cost whether the marketing cost is actually going to rise with the inflation or not. Now what next is there? So that means if it is not mentioned here, that means the marketing cost is not going to be subject to inflation. The marketing cost is not going to be subject to the inflation. Now what next is there? The next situation is it says the new investment will require immediate expenditure. Immediate expenditure means it's time period zero on facilities of $30.6 million. The tax allowable depreciation will be available in new investment at 25% reducing balance basis. It can be assumed there will be either a balancing allowance or a balancing charge in the final year of the approval. So there is actually going to be a balancing allowance or a balancing charge in the final year of the appraisal. Now what next is there? Now if we move forward, if we discuss further, so what actually happens is that it says that uh, it can be the finance director believe facilities remain viable after four years and therefore a reliable value of 13.5 million can be assumed at the end of the appraisal period. So at the end of the appraisal period, there's going to be a value of 13.5 million. So basically the residual value is going to be 13.5 million. Now what next is there? It says the new facilities will require an immediate initial investment in working capital of 3 million. So the working capital is usually invested at the start of the year, which is year zero, one, two, three, four, etc. It's the working capital requirement will increase by the rate of inflation for the next three years and any working capital at the start of year four will be assumed to be released at the end of the appraisal period. So that means the working capital is going to be recovered. 
it further says that the company pays tax at the rate of 30 percent it pays the company pays tax at the rate of 30 percent and taxes payable with a one year's time delay that means year one's taxes payable in two two's taxes payable in three threes in four four and five any tax losses on the investment can be assumed to be carried forward the tax losses could actually be carried forward and uh, the tax losses could actually be carried forward and what we can do with these tax losses is that you can actually carry them forward and uh, <clears throat> you can carry them forward <clears throat> now and write off against the future profits from the investment it says predicted inflation rates are as follows year one is going to be eight percent two is six percent three is four and four is four percent so these are the expected inflation rates now this is actually the financing element of the question so what i'm actually going to do is that i'm going to ignore the financing effects right now first of all what we are going to do is that we are going to perk our we are going to perform calculation on the basis of we are going to perform the calculation on the basis of the base case NPV and then we would separately discuss the financing side effects. So I'm actually ignoring this whole part right now and uh, What I am actually going to consider is going to be this part I am going to consider this part which is actually about the other information part So if I talk about this other information part it says Huma bus company is a large manufacturer of office equipment in Valley land Humabas geared geared cost of equity is estimated to be 10.5 percent and its pre-tax cost of debt is 5.4 percent So its cost of equity is 10.5 percent and uh, The pre-tax cost of debt which is actually KD is going to be 5.4 percent And it says these estimates are based on capital structure comprising 225 million six percent irredeemable bonds trading at 107 and 125 million equity shares trading at this index it says Humabuzz also pays tax at 30% of its taxable profit. So Humabuzz also pays tax at 30% of its taxable profit. Now, basically what happens is I'm actually going to go through the marking scheme also and I'm going to discuss that how the examiner gives you the marks. So what you actually need to understand is that you need to actually understand that what are the key steps in attempting this question. And once you know that what are the key steps in attempting those question, so you should try to actually attempt each and every step. And you should try to gain as much marks as possible because a lot of his students actually have got a time pressure I've got a problem that they are unable to manage the time So if you are unable to manage the time So the best way to actually do is that you should try and you should so what the best way to do is that you should try and you should ensure that you get the maximum marks wherever possible so in this scenario If we need to calculate the base case NPV so there are actually two elements to the calculation of base case NP. One of them is basically the cash flows. The other one of them is a discount rate. One of them is a cash flow. The other one of them is a discount rate. Now, so that means we will get marks for the calculation of cash flows. We'll get the marks for calculation of the discount rate. Now. Uh, let's recall the uh, Let's recall the capital asset pricing model In another capital asset pricing model. We say that cost of equity is risk-free rate of return plus equity beta Multiply the market rate of return minus half so What we do is that we say that uh, it is actually going to be like this uh, We say that uh, the capital asset pricing model states that the cost of equity is risk-free rate of return plus equity beta multiplied by market rate of return uh, minus the risk free rate of return now <clears throat> So that is one aspect uh, that we do the calculation of the cost of equity. But over here in this scenario, what we are actually being given is 
we are not being given we are not being given the risk free rate of return we are not being given the market rate of return we are neither being told about the uh, we are neither being told about the equity beta so how exactly are we going to solve this scenario so because what happens is that we need to actually calculate the cash flows we need to calculate the cash flows and we need to discount them we need to discount them using the ungeared cost of equity we need to discount them using the ungeared cost of equity now why do we need to discount them using the ungeared cost of equity because the reason behind that is uh, when we calculate assume that entity is 100% equity when we calculate the base case npv then we need to assume that the entity is 100% equity funded when we calculate the base case npv we assume that the entity is 100% equity funded so the thing is that we would actually have to use the we would actually have to use uh the un uh, the uh, ungeared cost of equity now how would we calculate the ungeared cost of equity so the best way of doing this question is going to be the application of modi glani and miller 2 model so that is what is actually going to help you in doing that now what exactly is the formula for mm2 that is actually the cost of equity of a geared company is cost of equity of an ungeared company is a cost of equity of an ungeared company uh plus 1 minus uh, t and then you actually multiply it with the, the cost of equity of an ungeared company minus the cost of debt and then you multiply it with market value of debt divided by market value of equity that's how you do it so what is the formula for mm2 mm2's formula is cost of equity of the geared company is cost of equity of ungeared company plus 1 minus t Uh, bracket open then cost of equity ungeared minus cost of debt multiplied by debt upon equity's market value now why exactly are we using the mm2 in this specific scenario the reason behind using the mm2 in this specific scenario is we need to calculate the base case npv and how do we calculate the base case npv we calculate the base case npv on the assumption that the entity or the project is 100% equity funded so when the project is 100% equity funded that means you need to use the ungeared cost of equity you need to use the ungeared cost of equity so now let's actually try to calculate the ungeared cost of equity using this scenario if we say in the given scenario we have got the cost of equity uh, uh, the cost of equity uh, which is actually the geared cost of equity we are being given in the questions other information and that is actually 10.5% so we have been told this is actually 10.5% now the tax rate is 30% the uh, cost of debt is 5.4% the market value of the debt is and the market value of equity is so when we talk about the market value of the debt and the market value of the equity so we are actually being told that the entity has uh, 225 million irredeemable bonds and these bonds are trading at 107 so basically 107 divided by 100 so this is what the bonds are actually trading at so resultingly if you are going to see so what are we going to get we are going to get 225 multiplied by 107 divided by 100 how much does it turn out to be okay so it turns out to be 240.75 then we need to calculate the market value of the equity we have got 125 million shares each of the share is actually uh, worth a dollar so if we say it's worth a dollar multiply by each share is presently trading at 3.2 so how much does it turn out to be okay so it's actually 400 uh le naik the formula for the market value of debt is very simple uh if you could actually look at this question the examiner actually tells you in this question that the entity has 225 million dollars 6% irredeemable bonds trading at 107 per 100 now what exactly do mean by this this means that you have got 225 million dollar bond each bond is worth 100 as a par value So when you divide this 225 million divided by 100, so you end up getting the number of bonds. You end up getting the number of bonds, 
and when you multiply it with 107 you end up getting the market value of the debt or the market value of the bond so that's how you get the market value of the debt so the market value of the debt in this scenario is actually 240.75 is that clear Okay, which 6%? Which 6% are you talking about? I would suggest that don't round off right now because uh, when you calculate uh, the cost of equity, so it's actually already going to be in decimal places. So we would already be rounding off that cost of equity. Uh, so it's better that you don't round off uh, this uh, um, this this uh, market value of debt right now anyways if we put these things into the scenario so basically our question is going to be like this 10.5 percent is equivalent to uh, the value of X which is the ke of the ungeared company plus it is going to be 1 minus 0.3 and then it is going to be um, it is going to be X minus uh, uh, 5.4 percent it's going to be X minus 5.4 percent And then it's going to be uh, D upon E, so it's 240.75 divided by 400. So what you'll have to do is that you'll have to solve for X. So what are we going to get when we are going to solve for X?
Okay, so it's actually nine percent that we have. So the uh, so that the, so the cost of equity, the ungeared cost of equity is actually nine percent. Now let's move forward. So that's the first step, uh, and we would actually get marks for this. So always ensure that you try to get as much marks as possible by doing a small baby steps to a question. So as we started off with this question, the first thing that we were actually required to do is to calculate the base case NP. And in order to calculate the base case NPV, the appropriate information that was available to us was the use uh, of uh, this uh, MM2. So we calculated the discount rate. Now we are going to calculate the base case NPV. Now, how exactly are you going to calculate the base case NPV? So what I would do is that in order to save time, I'm going to try and solve this uh, on Excel so that uh, we don't have much of an issue because at times uh, then I'm actually going to be waiting for the answers and I'm not going to be getting the answers. So it at times uh, becomes uh, an unusual situation. So anyways, uh, let's actually talk about it. The first thing that is going to happen is we would have year zero. We would have year one, two, three, four and another year which is going to be year five. So you'll have five years. Now, why am I actually going for five years? I'm going for five years because in this question examiner tells us that the tax is payable one year in arrears. So we do know that when the tax is payable one year in arrear, that actually means that uh, we'll have to pay for the fourth year's tax in the fifth year. Now the first of all, which is the operating cash flow, the operating cash flow, which is uh, excluding the marketing cost, the operating cash flow, which is excluding the marketing cost. Let's talk about this. So if I talk about this operating cash flow excluding the marketing cost, so I'm actually being told it's going to be 2000 in year one. It's going to be 14,000 in year two. And then the examiner tells us that this is actually going to be what? It tells us that this is actually going to be increasing. How? It is going to be increasing by the levels of inflation in year three and year four. So the levels of inflation in year three and year four are going to be 5% and 4%. So I'm actually going to say that this is actually going to multiply by 1.05. So this would become 15225 and the next year's inflation is actually 4%. So it's going to be increasing by a 4% inflation in the year four. So that's what we are actually going to have. So the operating cash flow excluding the marketing is going to be like this. Then the next situation is actually going to be we'll have the marketing cost. We'll have the marketing cost now how much is going to be the marketing cost so we were actually being told the marketing costs are predicted to be 9 million in year one and 2 million in each of the year two to four we are not being told that they would actually be subject to inflation or not and we're not being told about this in the entire question also that whether these are going to be subject to inflation or not so basically what we are going to do is that we're going to assume that they're not going to be subject to inflation so this is actually going to be 9,000 and this is going to be uh, 2000 in each of the year two three and four. So this is how it is going to be So what are we going to have we are going to have the cash flow before taxation cash flow before taxation So the cash flow before taxation is going to be like this So this is what we will have we will have year one negative 7000 which is going to be a loss year two 12,500 year three 13 to do five year four so and so so and so the examiner has specifically told us one thing and that is basically that uh, That the tax rate is 30 percent So the examiner has told us that the tax rate is 30 percent and taxes payable in a year's time delay and he's also told us that any tax losses on the investment can be assumed to be carried forward and written off against future profits from the investment. So that means in case if there is any if there is going to be any tax loss that actually needs to be carried forward. So what, is we, what are we going to do? We are going to say cash flow before taxation. Now the next thing that we are going to do is that we are going to calculate the tax expense. So now how exactly are we going to calculate the tax expense so for this what I'm actually going to do is that I'm going to refer to a working I'm going to refer to a working I'm going to say that the workings to actually perform this uh, is going to be let's say working a now What is going to be there in working a let's actually talk about the working a So 
So if I talk about working A, which is actually the computation of uh, taxable, uh, computation of tax expense, computation of tax expense. So how much is it going to be? It's going to be year one, then year two, year three, and then year four. Now what is actually going to happen is that we have got the taxable profit slash loss. Which is going to be like this. The taxable profit or loss is going to be. So these are the taxable profits or loss for the year one, two, three, and four. Now what next is there? The next situation is going to be that we are going to say that we need to deduct the tax depreciation from it. We need to deduct the tax depreciation from it. So once we are actually going to calculate the tax depreciation, now what we need to do is that we need to perform the calculation for the tax depreciation. So I'm going to mark it B. I'm going to mark it B. Now, how would we calculate the tax depreciation? Let's actually talk about it. So that is actually going to be computation of tax depreciation. Now the tax depreciation is going to be computed like this. This is uh, year uh, zero. This is uh, the depreciation. Then this is uh, year one. Then there is this depreciation and then year two and then year three and then year four. Two. So you'll have this is year one, this is year two, this is year three, and this is year four. Now let's talk. So year one, we will have the original investment as 30,600. Where do we get this 30,600 from? So we are actually being told that the investment uh, would immediately be 30.6 million. So we're being told it's going to be 30.6 million. Now what next is there? The next situation is actually going to be that uh, when you'll have 30.6 so the depreciation is going to be at the rate of the depreciation is going to be at the rate of 25 percent so if it is going to be at 25 percent it is going to be so 7650 is going to be the depreciation in the year one then we'll have 22,950. Then it is again going to be like this. And then another year, it is going to be like this. So we'll have 12,909 as the carrying amount as at year three. Now what next? Um, for the year four, we would actually actually go about it like this. When the year four comes in, you would not be charging any depreciation. You would actually not be charging any depreciation. You would actually be going for uh, Husai, I think the voice is uh, clear. Uh, please check again. Maybe you might need to uh, leave the um, webinar and join back again. Now, so what is going to happen? You will say that uh, it's actually going to be year three, and then you would actually say that what is going to happen is uh, we will have uh, a balancing allowance or a balancing charge in the year four. Balancing allowance or balancing charge. Now, how would we actually figure out this thing? So we are actually being told that uh, the asset would have a realizable value of 13.5 million. So if the asset would have a realizable value of 13.5 million. So we'll have 13,500 minus this amount. So this is actually going to be a balancing charge. It's going to be a balancing charge. Had it been a negative amount, it would have been a balancing allowance. So it is actually going to be a balancing charge. Now what next? So basically I've calculated the tax depreciations here. And once I've got the tax depreciation, what am I going to do now? I'm going to do it this way. My tax depreciation is going to be. This is what my tax depreciation is going to be. So basically if I say that a taxable profit or loss is going to be what it's going to be a sum of this amount. And what we will do is that we would actually say that uh, the loss brought forward which is adjusted and then basically what happens is uh, the
we would say that carry forward and then we would actually say that this is actually a taxable uh, cash flow now if we say over here the brought forward amount is zero and we would have all of this as carried forward so the taxable cash flow is going to be zero so the tax at the rate of 30 percent is also going to be zero now what is going to happen in the next year the next year we will actually have a brought forward uh, loss and what is that brought forward loss going to be so the brought forward loss is going to be this uh, 14,650 so if we actually talk about it the brought forward loss is going to be 14,650 so we are actually going to figure out that how much is going to be the carry forward loss so the carry forward loss is going to be this plus this the carry forward loss is 7887 the taxable cash flow is again going to be zero and you'd have a taxable uh, tax of zero in the next year what is going to happen in the next year what is going to happen is we'll have this brought forward loss of 7887.5 and once we are actually going to do so the carry forward amount is going to be zero here and we would have a taxable profit of this plus this is going to be 1034 and we would have a tax of 310 and in the next year we would actually have in the next year we would have a brought forward loss of zero the k forward is also going to be zero and we'll have this much uh, of the taxable cash flow and this is going to be the tax that we will be paying so basically if the examiner asks us that what is going to be the tax so we need to calculate the tax like this I hope this is clear on all side no 590 cannot be negative you see the 590 has to be positive it has to be 13,500 which is actually uh, 13,500 which is uh, actually the residual value less the carrying amount which is 12,909 and uh, furthermore if I do discuss further then what is actually gonna happen is that uh, we actually will have to pay the tax now somebody is asking why did you stop down the depreciation in the year three you can if you want you can perform the depreciation in year four also end of the day you will get the same answer i'll give you a brief uh, demonstration of what happens if we do the same calculation for the year four also now what happens is if we don't do it this way here so what is going to happen is if you perform the depreciation in the year uh, four also if you perform the debt in year four also then what would happen is uh, you would actually be saying that uh, balancing allowance or balancing uh, charge so it is actually going to be what 13,500 minus this amount so it's 3817 so if you actually sum up these two this is going to be this plus this the year three figure would uh, year four figure would be 591 so it is uh, recommended that what you should actually do is that you should actually rather going for rather going for uh, um, rather going for the calculation of the uh, capital allowance or the depreciation in the fourth year it's actually going to be better off that you uh, do not calculate that and you rather calculate the net balancing allowance or the balancing charge now let's summarize so basically up till now what have we done what have we done up till now we have actually calculated two things the first of all we calculated the operating cash flows we incorporated the marketing costs so we incorporated the cash flow before taxation once we had the cash flow before taxation so we had to perform some working so we did this working number one which is for the calculation of the tax expense we calculated the taxable profit or loss which was already calculated there we brought forward that we calculated the tax depreciation for the various periods and on the basis of that we calculated the taxable profit or loss once we had the taxable profit or loss so we adjusted the appropriate uh, brought forward taxes and etc etc resultingly we have these tax figures resultingly we have got these tax figures so these are the taxation figures that we are actually going to bear so these are the taxes that we'll have to pay now what next is there now so basically the tax expense is going to be like this So the tax expenses are going to be like this so resultingly what we will have is we'll have the we'll have these uh, tax expense so we've already calculated that now what next
Now, <clears throat> so the next situation is basically we have calculated the tax expense. Now, what next is there? The next situation is we have got the investment. How much is the investment? The investment is basically negative uh, 30,600 in the year zero and we will have a 13,500 as a residual value in the year uh, four. Okay, Khalil al Ravai, which part are you talking about? Okay. Uh, the taxation is in areas. So it's actually going to be year one and year two, year two and year three, year three and year four, and year four and year five. So that's how the tax is going to be. So the taxation will be shown in areas because it's payable one year after the one. Now, what next is there? The next situation is investment is there, which is 30,600. We have got year four, which is the residual value, 13,500. Now, what next is there? We have got the working capital. So what am I actually going to do is that I'm going to perform working C for the working capital. Now, you would actually be asking that how would you perform the working C for the working capital? So let's actually talk about that. What is going to be there in working C for the working capital? What is the relevant? Uh, what is the relevant scenario with respect to the working capital? So we are actually being told if I actually go through this working capital. So we are actually being told that the entity would actually be requiring a working capital of 3 million at initially and the requirement will increase for the next three years and any working capital at the start of the fair will be assumed to be released. So the requirement of the working capital will increase. Now, how would we perform the calculation of working capital that needs to be understood? So basically what is going to happen is you would say this is year. This is the working capital amount and this is the incremental working capital now what is this so basically the first year working capital needs are 3 million first year working capital needs are 3 million so it will say 3000 the working capital requirement is actually going to increase in line with the inflation the working capital requirement will increase in line with the inflation now How much is the inflation in the year three? Uh, second year, six percent into 1.06. Then year four is going to be this multiply by 1.05. So this is how the working capital would actually be required for the year one, two, three, and four. Now, what is going to happen? So the incremental working capital is going to be like this. Uh, the first year is going to be 3000. The second is going to be this minus this minus the opening. Then there's going to be this minus opening and then this one. Now, so these working capital would actually be invested in when these are actually going to be invested in uh, year zero, uh, year one, year two, and then year three. So this is how the working capital would be invested in from in the year one. Some in uh, some in year zero, some in year one, some in year two, some in year three. Now, <clears throat> basically, the requirement of the working capital is increasing. So, what we are going to do is that we are going to say that we shall actually be needing this much working capital. Now, let's talk. The working capital that will be shown is going to be. Uh, in year zero because working capital is made available at the start of the year. The working capital is made available at the start of the year. Then you will have and then you will have uh, this much in the year three and at the end of the year four, the entire working capital 
would actually be recovered so that would be shown as an inflow how much is the entire working capital that has been invested up till now that's 3606 so resultingly the entire working capital would actually be recovered now what next is there so we have got these working capital there and then this is actually going to be the total of cash flows that we will have shall have the total of cash flow which is going to be the sum of these all four now and then what we would have is we would have a discount factor uh, the rate is actually nine percent because we are required to calculate the base case and so we would actually be calculating so we'll put in the discount factors for the various periods and once we actually put in the discount factors so we'll have the discounted uh, cash flow or we could actually call them the present value we could actually call them the present value so the present values are actually going to be what this into this <coughs> so these are actually going to be the present values and once we have the present values so what we need to do is that we need to calculate the base case we need to calculate the base case npv the base case npv is going to be what it's going to be a sum of all these so the base case NPV is 918, 919 or approximately 920. You could get 920 also, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Now, so what I'm actually going to do is that I'm going to stop here for uh, some two, three minutes so that uh, people can actually digest what has happened and they can move forward. So anyone uh, having any issue with whatever shown on this specific uh, sheet, anyone having any issue? Okay, so nobody is having any issues with this. Anyone having any issues with this uh, computation of tax expense? Okay, you have issues with the calculation of the tax depreciation. So let's actually talk about it. Let's actually talk about the tax depreciation computation. So basically, uh, what exactly is uh, wrong with the tax depreciation? What's wrong? What is it that you are unable to understand? We stop in the air where there is a balance. Yes, we do stop in the air where there is a balancing figure. Okay, now see, uh, let's go through this uh, tax depreciation calculation. So originally we had an asset of thirty thousand six hundred. Then what we did was we had this uh, seven six five zero depreciation. So the year one we have a carrying amount of this. Then we have further depreciation. We have a carrying amount of this at the year two. Then we have further depreciation and we have carrying amount of this at year three. Now what I have actually done is. I have not calculated any depreciation in year year four and what I've simply done is I've simply calculated one thing I've said that I need to calculate the tax gain or loss on disposal what I've simply done is I've calculated the tax gain or loss on disposal now basically when we calculate this tax gain or loss on disposal this actually covers up both aspects now what does it actually covers up it actually covers up the depreciation for the year four also and it also covers up any gain or loss so the net effect of this 591 includes everything there was uh, Samuel is it okay okay perfect now there was a student who was asking that what if how to include the value of okay okay now uh, Philip just wait a second now there was a student who was asking that is there any other way of incorporating this tax depreciation in the calculation so yes there is another way of doing it now what is that way of doing it is you can do it this way also now what is this way uh, what i've actually done over here is i have performed a same calculation but i have now gone on to year four also i've now gone on to year four also and when i've actually gone on to year four so i've actually done is uh, there is a depreciation of 3,227 in year 4. 
so we have a carrying amount of 9682 and when we actually dispose of this asset for 13500 so we are actually going to get a gain of 3817 so what is going to be shown in year 4 in year 4 we will actually be showing a loss of 3227 and we will be showing a gain of 3817 resultingly it will be 591 so a better approach would be that rather than entering into this many calculations you could directly calculate the 591 by ignoring the tax depreciation for the year 4 Is it okay now? Okay, Ahmad Ali Ayub is asking for a question and his question is basically uh, He's saying that what if the examiner would have said that uh, this is an after tax uh, This is an after tax uh, uh, Residual value so if the question a very good question Ahmad if the question would have asked after tax residual value You would have performed the calculation this way which is you would have calculated the year four uh, Residual value and there would have been no tax gain or loss on this board. So if the uh, Remember this thing if the residual value is This method is going to be applicable where residual value is pre-tax if the residual value is pre-tax So this method is appropriate method now if the examiner says residual value If the examiner says residual value is post tax If the examiner says residual value is post tax, so what are you going to do? You calculate depreciation in year 4 you calculate depreciation in year 4 and you do not calculate Any gain slash loss on this Do not calculate any gain slash loss Just calculate the depreciation in year 4. So I'm repeating it again if the examiner says that the examiner says that the residual value is post tax then you calculate the debt in year 4 and do not calculate any gain or loss so that's how you need to deal with it now let's move forward so we have actually calculated the base case NPV Now <clears throat> let's move forward So let's go on to the other part of the question <clears throat> So we are now required to calculate the financing side effects We are required to calculate the present value of the financing side effects now How exactly are we going to calculate the present value of financing side effects? So let's actually talk about it So the present value of financing side effects is what we actually need to calculate now How do we calculate these present value of financing side effects? Now what you need to understand is that um, There are various aspects of the financing and those various aspects actually are number one is the issue cost What exactly do we mean by issue cost and how exactly do we consider those issue costs in the calculation? So issue cost actually means when you fund a project using debt or when you fund a project using the equity you at times have to pay the cost of issuance of those debt instrument or the equity instrument and those issue costs are also commonly termed as the transaction cost so i'm going to repeat it again at times what happens is what is the concept of issue cost the issue cost is actually the cost that you incur while actually borrowing funds while actually issuing the shares etc etc that is what is considered to be the issue cost now number two so what we actually need to do is that we need to incorporate the effect of the issue cost How would we incorporate the effect of the issue cost? So you'll have to wait for some five minutes before I get on to those things The second thing is that we need to consider the effect of tax savings Due to interest We know can we need to consider the effects of tax savings due to interest
Now, what do we mean by this? Basically, what happens is when we pay interest, when we pay interest, we get tax savings. So we need to incorporate the effect of those tax savings also. Uh, Maria Khan, uh, please wait for some time and I'm actually going to share a link of the WhatsApp group. Please share, please wait for some time. Okay, Nadam, Nadim, just wait for a while. Yeah, here you go. Okay, uh, we're gonna do it. Just wait. Just wait now So the number two is the tax saving due to interest. What exactly is it going to be? So when you will actually be borrowing the funds you would be paying interest So there would actually be tax savings that would arise out of it. So we'd consider them also Now at times what happens is uh, there is actually going to be the benefit of subsidized loan at times what happens is there are actually the benefits of subsidized loans so we are going to consider them also. Now, how exactly are we going to consider all these financing side effects? Let's have a quick go through of the question because what I did was I only restricted myself to the area which pertain to the I only discussed the area which actually pertain to the base case NPV. I did not go towards the financing side effects. Now what am I going to do is that I'm going to talk about the financing side effects now. Now let's talk. When we talk about the concept of financing the investment, it says Tiplitin has been considering two choices for financing all of the 30.6 million needed for the initial investment in the facilities. Now, how much is it going to be? It says a subsidized loan from the government loan scheme with the loan repayable at the end of the four years. So there is going to be a government scheme where the loan is going to be repayable in four years time. It says issue cost of 4% of gross finance would be payable. The issue cost of 4% of the gross finance would be payable. And it further says that the interest. It further says that the interest would be payable at the rate of 30 basis points. 30 basis points means 0.3% below the risk free rate of 2.5%. So that means we are actually going to be paying at 2.5 minus 0.3% gives you 2.2%. In order to obtain the benefits of the loan scheme, Tiplitin would have to fulfill various conditions. And those conditions including the facilities in a remote part of Valley Land where unemployment is high. Now what the entity needs to do is that it would have to fulfill a lot of things. It says the issue cost for the subsidized loan. The further more it says that uh, convertible loan notes can also be used. Now what I'm actually going to doing is I'm ignoring the convertible loan note portion right now. Now you are going to ask why 
that's what i'm actually trying to teach you people that you should only restrict yourself to the relevant information which is needed at this point of time now what is that relevant information the question is specifically mentioned the question is specifically mentioned calculate adjusted present value on the basis that it is financed by subsidized loan so if it is financed by subsidized loan so i'm only going to restrict myself to the subsidized loan right now because the convertible loan note is the next part of the question so i'm not going to go through the next part of the question right now i'm just restricting myself to the subsidized loan so what are we being told we are being told that a subsidized loan from the government uh, repayable in 4 years with a 4% gross finance cost uh, there would be an interest of risk 30 basis point below the risk free rate which is going to be 2.2 now <clears throat> now furthermore um, if i just quickly skim through the information there in the convertible loan notes it says convertible loan notes with a subscriber for the notes including some of tipli team directors loan notes would have a issue cost of 4% of the gross finance if not converted loan notes would be redeemed in 6 years time and it would be the interest would be payable at 5% which is tipli team's normal cost of borrowing so the most important information here is tipli team's normal cost of borrowing is 5% it says conversion would take place at an effective price of so and so so and so these are all irrelevant information now what is most important is it says issue cost for subsidized loan and convertible would be paid out of available cash reserve which is very important it says issue costs are not allowable as tax deductible expense issue costs are not allowable as a tax deductible expense now these are important things now what next is there Okay, now see if we talk about the issue cost here. So the funds that we actually need is thirty point six million. The funds we actually need is thirty point six million. And if we say the examiner tells us that the issue costs are going to be four percent of the gross finance that is going to be uh, on the issue cost of four percent of the gross finance would be payable. So that means. just just wait for a second just wait for a second please so if we talk about it it's actually going to be for the gross finance required so that means when we are actually going to generate finance the issue cost would be deducted out of it so basically what is going to happen is we would actually be borrowing such amount of funds such that we are actually ended up with a net amount of 30.6 million that means that means this 30.6 million is 96% so x is going to be 4% so this x which is the issue cost is actually going to be what please share the issue cost amount Yeah, please share the issue cost amount. Oh, 
okay so it's actually going to be 1.275 million or as we say 1275 because we are working in terms of thousands so the issue cost is going to be 1275 now what next is there so we are done with the issue cost now what next um, the examiner tells us that the issue cost is not tax deductible. So if the issue cost is not tax deductible So what we would actually do is that we would actually uh, We would actually just put the issue cost like this the issue cost is not tax deductible therefore no tax savings etc Now there are two questions that the students can have now What are those two questions that are going to be that? Where is this working capital going to be financed from? So as you see here, we are actually being told the issue cost for the subsidized loan and convertible loan notes would be paid out of available cash reserves. So it says that the issue cost would be paid out of the available cash reserves. So a better assumption is going to be you can say that the working capital is also being paid out of the cash reserves that are available. That's a better uh, approach. Okay, there is somebody who's asking that how did you get 1275? Okay, so how did I get 1275? Basically 30.6 million is the net amount of finance that we need So what is gonna happen is we will go for raising the finance So whatever finance that we will raise the bank or the issuer would actually deduct their cost element from that so what we want is we want to generate that many funds that we are actually able to get net amount of 30.6 million in our hand so resultingly this 30.6 million is going to be 96 percent, which is after deducting of the issue and source Okay, now what next is there next situation is uh, Please the, there is actually a link of the whatsapp group that's actually being shared with you people so what you people could do is that you can join using that link Now what next is there The next situation is now number two which is actually the tax savings Due to interest now Let's see <coughs> Um The interest that we will actually be paying is going to be the interest that we'll actually be paying is going to be 30,600 multiplied by 2.2 percent So the interest that we will actually be paying every year is going to be 30,600 into 2.2 percent. How much does it turn out to be? So it turns out to be 673.2 It turns out to be 673.2 Okay, and then what we would have is we would have the tax savings at the rate of 30% So how much the tax saving turns out to be? 201.96 is what the tax saving is Now, Sarah, it's workable. Please try again. Uh, please try to just copy from the chat window. Now, the tax saving is 201.96. Now, this tax saving is going to be from year one, year two, till year four, to year two, till year five. Now, why is it going to be from year two till year five? The reason behind that is uh, because uh, we will actually be paying tax one year in area. So, the savings are going to arise one year in area. Now, what next is there? The next is basically going to be we would actually need to use the year 2 to year 5 NUD factor in order to discount this tax saving because this is an annual tax saving 
it would arise in year two, year three, year four, year five. So how would we actually what sort of annuity factor is going to be there? So we would use the five year annuity factor and then we would deduct the one year PV factor from it. So we will get year two to year five annuity factor. Now the most important thing is that if there is this tax saving due to interest, then what should be the discount rate at which we should be discounting them? So the discount rate at which we should be discounting them is going to be the discount rate that we would be actually discounting it is going to be the applicable rate. So what is the applicable rate? The applicable rate could actually be The applicable rate could actually be the market rate of 5% The applicable rate could actually be 2.2% the subsidized road lane so the appropriate generally rate is the market rate that is applicable. So the market rate is 5%. So let's actually try to discount it using the 5% and see what it turns out to be. Tarendra, why would you add back the tax allowable depreciation? We did not deduct it. We just calculated the tax rate. Uh, Mariam Sana, that would be wrong because the cost of debt is actually the company's cost of debt. What you need to do is that you need to calculate the project specific cost of debt. The project specific cost of debt is going to be if the entity would borrow normally, the normal borrowing would be 5%. So use 5% use the five year annuity factor then deduct the one year PV factor out of it. Okay, can you people please share that what is it going to be? So this is actually going to be 201.96 into 3.377. So it is going to be 682. Now what next is there? So up till now when we talk about the financing side effects, what have we done? We have calculated the issue cost. We have calculated the tax saving due to interest. We now need to move forward and we now need to discuss further. So the third situation that we are actually going to move forward is going to be. So the third thing is going to be. Net interest saved. On subsidized loan. So when we talk about the net interest saved on the subsidized loan, let's actually talk about it. There's somebody asking that why did you deduct year one PV? So basically the point is these tax savings are arising from year two to year five. When you calculate the five year annuity factor that is from year one till five. So you need to deduct the year one PV factor out of it so that you can get two till five. Now what is this net interest saved on the subsidized loan? So you need to understand this thing had it been a normal borrowing had it been a normal borrowing we would have been paying 5% but because of this subsidized loan 
because of the subsidized loan we have ended up paying 2.2 percent so resultingly because of specifically undertaking this project we have ended up saving 2.8 percent so because of undertaking this project we have ended up saving 2.8 percent now what is going to happen so as i mentioned that the normal borrowing is five percent as i mentioned that the subsidized rate loan is 2.2 percent so there is actually a 2.8 percent saving now 2.8 percent saving is actually on a loan of 30,600. so when you'll actually save the interest so you would say the interest saved per year is going to be what So that is going to be 856.8 now when we are actually going to save interest we are going to end up paying extra tax on it now the problem is that uh, the interest is going to be saved uh, We'll have an extra tax at the rate of 30%, which is going to be what? So it is going to be 257.04. Now you need to understand one thing, which is actually the interest is saved from year one till year four, and the extra tax is actually being imposed from year two till year five so resultingly when we are going to be calculating this tax benefit when we are going to be calculating this tax benefit what we are going to do is that we are going to say that this 856.8 should be multiplied by a four year nud factor at five percent and this 257.04 should be multiplied by year two till year five annual factor at five percent so that's what you are going to do and then you will have the net benefit from the subsidized loan yes you take four year annuity factor for uh, year one till four and then you take year two to five annuity factor for the tax savings So please calculate how much does it turn out to be?
Okay, <clears throat> for those of you who are actually having an issue in understanding that what have we done with respect to it? So you need to understand had you borrowed normally you would have ended up paying 5% of interest But since it was a subsidized loan courtesy this project you ended up paying 2.2 so resultingly the saving was 2.8% and when we have 2.8% the loan amount is 30,600 so we have an interest saved of 856.8 now this interest will be saved from year 1 till 4. So we'll have 856.8 multiplied by 4 year annuity factor at 5%. But if the interest is saved, there will be extra tax imposed on it. And the extra tax is going to be 30%. And that turns out to be 257.04, but that would be imposed from year 2 till year 5. So what you now need to do is that you need to calculate the tax extra tax present value from year 2 till year 5. So how does it turn out to be? Please do calculate. Okay, one of them is 3038. And the other one of them is 868. So if we sum up, if we sum this up, so this would turn out to be It's going to be 2170. <laughs> it's going to be 2170. So if I actually conclude this uh, question, so I'm going to say that the APV is basically what is the base case NPV, which is negative 918 in this scenario, and the present value of Financing side effect is going to be like this. You will have the issue cost, which is actually 1275. Then you have got the tax saving due to interest, and the tax saving due to interest is actually. 682 and then you would have the net interest saved from subsidized loan which is going to be 2170 resultingly what is going to happen is we will have the APV that just said present value as what So it's actually 659. What is it? 659. So it is 659. Are you people okay with this? Okay, perfect. So let me summarize the question. This question was basically part A of the question we have done. So part of the question actually required us to calculate that just fit present value. What information were we given? We were given information for the computation of the NPV and we were actually being given the geared cost of equity of the entity. So what we did was we actually used that geared cost of equity. We used the debt and on the basis of MM2, we simply figured out the ungeared cost of equity and that turned out to be 9%. So when it turned out to be 9%, so the next thing that we did was we performed the calculation for the NPV. And we performed the calculation in order to make things easier for us. We performed the calculation of the NPV on the Microsoft Excel. So this NPV turned out to be uh, this NPV turned out to be 918.874911 negative. And then what we did was uh, <clears throat> we then moved on to the present value of financing side effects. 
and while calculating the present value of financing side effects <coughs> we use the issue cost we calculated the tax saving due to interest and then we incorporated the effect of net interest saved on the subsidized loan uh, so we ended up getting 659 as the overall APV now there are a few questions pertaining to it somebody says that for additional tax don't we need to discount it by the PV of 5% for year one additional tax okay now see your interest is actually saved in year one till year four and you pay tax one year in arrear so the tax would arise from year two to year five so Tharendra, you are asking that why didn't we discount using the present value of five percent for year one so the reason behind that is the tax saving is not arising in year one tax saving is arising from year two till year five Amna Ahmed, how did you calculate net benefit? Net benefit of what? Net benefit of the uh, subsidized loan. So you see, we did it this way. What did we do? First of all, we calculated 3038 as the interest saved, and then we deducted this 868 as an extra tax. Okay, now if uh, Omar Yusuf is asking if we are borrowing investment 30.6 plus 1.2 then we are already not financing the cost of loan from the loan itself rather than available cash. No, 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 no. Basically what happens is when we actually borrow. So we want the net amount of 30.6. So we actually borrow more now because what we happen is we get net amount of this. And then what we do is that we actually sort of use our own funds to repay this uh, borrowing cost resulting a loan amount uh, actually goes down to 30.6 okay so we are done with uh, this part a of the um, question and now let's actually move on to the next part of the question now what exactly is the next part of the question the next part of the question is it says discuss the issues it says discuss the issues which typically teens shareholders who are not directors would consider if its directors decided that the new investment if its directors decided that the new investment should be financed by the issue of convertible loan notes on the terms suggested now so what I would do is that I would actually ask you people to take around uh, five minutes and then we can actually start uh, discussing about this take five minutes and think what could be done about this requirement take five minutes on this
Okay, now next. So basically, <clears throat> this part B of the question, uh, which is uh, worth eight marks in the scenario. But generally, if you look at the P, this uh, AFM paper, um, approximately around 50-55% of the paper is based on the theoretical aspects and the students, they tend to miss out on those. Now, let's just talk about what is the examiner asking. It says discuss the issues which Tipletine's shareholders who are not directors, who are not directors, would consider if its director decided that new investment should be financed by the issue of convertible loan notes on terms suggested. Now, so what is actually going to happen? Let's talk. It says, now the key points need to be highlighted. It says convertible loan notes with subscriber for the notes, including some of the directors. So basically number one of them is the directors would also be the subscribers. So one of the point that needs to be noted is directors will also subscribe. Now the next situation is that the loan notes would have an issue cost of so and so if not converted the loan notes can be redeemed in six years time. So the redemption period is actually six years. Interest would be payable at 5%. The rate of interest is actually be 5%. Conversion would take place in an effective price of 2.75 per share. The conversion rate is 2.75. However, loan note holders could enforce redemption at any time from the start of year three. So the redemption time period is from year three onwards. If share price below 1.5 per share. Triptyline's current share price is 2.2. So the current share price is 2.2. Furthermore, initial discussion, majority of the board favored using subsidized loan. The appraisal of investment should be prepared on the basis of this method. However, chairman argued strongly in favor of convertible loan loan. As in his view, operating costs will be lower if Triptyline does not have to fulfill the conditions laid down by government of Valley Land. Tipletine's finance director is skeptical, however, about whether shareholders would approve the issue of convertible loan notes on terms suggested. Directors will decide the method of finance to use at the next board meeting. Now you see, um, there are various aspects which you actually need to consider as a student that what exactly are going to be the things with the existing shareholders would do. Because the question is specifically focused upon uh, the issues which they would actually be considering. Now, the various issues that a shareholder would actually consider is that number one, if I am actually a shareholder of a company and uh, the company is looking for a proposed method of financing, so my issues are actually going to be <coughs> that the company is going for a loan finance. Now, <coughs> this loan finance would actually, how would it affect me? How would it affect me? Now, it would actually affect me in this way that if the loan holders go for conversion, if the loan holders go for conversion, then that would actually mean dilution of my shareholding. So I'm actually going to be concerned about the dilution of my own shareholding because that if we do issue the convertible loan note, then it is actually going to be diluted. It's going if they convert, then it's going to be dilution. Now. The second concern is actually going to be the directors will also subscribe. Now, this could be good, this could be bad also. Now, why would it be good? Why would it be bad? It would be good because the directors have got a stake also in the new investment because if it fails, their investment will also go down. But at the same time, this would be bad also that their proportionate holding would increase. Okay, the third point. So these are the first point. This is the second point. The third point is going to be that uh, holders have early redemption option. So basically what happens is what if if they require repayment in the third year, 
then what is going to be how would we finance it how to finance this uh, year 3 repayment year 4 number 4 point number 4 point is going to be the rate of interest uh, we are actually paying them 5% which is same as straight bonds now what do we mean by same as a straight bonds that is bonds without conversion option so why are we actually paying them the same rate which is the rate for the conversion of for the bonds without conversion option because generally speaking the convertible bonds are cheaper in uh, value they're not that much uh, the cost as the normal bonds the next situation is The next situation is that it is too secured for the loan note holders. They can get it converted. Point number three is holders have early redemption option that they can redeem a bit early. If they want, they can redeem in year three. So my point is that how am I going to finance their repayment? So the bond is too secured. Basically what happens is if the project does not, if the project does not yield good returns if the project does not yield good returns then the problem that is going to happen is that they would actually require repayment so it's actually going to be too big a problem for us so these are the various things and uh, that actually the existing shareholders would consider you can think about few more points but generally speaking you need to put yourself into the position of the shareholder and you need to think that how is it actually going to affect you you need to think that how it's actually going to affect you. So once you are actually going to put this onto yourself, it would become a quite easier for you to actually decide that um, what is the existing shareholder going to be thinking. Okay, so what I'm actually going to do is that now I'm going to open up. I'm actually going to open up uh, the uh, answer to this question so that uh, we can have an idea at what exactly is the examiner looking at in fact sorry i'm going to open up the marking scheme of this question so that we could have a better idea okay as I did mention earlier, let's talk about uh, the marking scheme of the question. So you see where exactly are you going to get marks operating cash flow excluding marketing cost one mark tax allowable depreciation one marks taxation two marks working capital two marks discount factor two marks base cost NPV tax yield on loan subsidy tax yield on subsidy adjusted present value comments and conclusion. So uh, yes, Amartya, there is also a point the voting rights can be affected because of the exercise the shareholding the voting rights are going to affect. Now what what I'm actually going to highlight is you see this marking scheme. If you look at this marking scheme, this marking scheme is actually going to tell you that you will get marks for every single step that you will perform. Like you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. Even if you don't actually, even if you don't actually do everything correctly, you will still gonna get marks. So that's what the marking scheme is actually suggesting you. So there was a question that if what if I don't what if I skip this step if you skip that step you'll miss too much. You won't miss out the entire question. And then part B is one to two mark per point. So basically it's not just going to be that you will get one mark per point. It's good to think like that that one mark per point, but you can get more than one mark also per point. So it's good to think that it's one mark per point, but you can get more than one mark a point also. Okay, uh, so everyone is clear on this question. Yes, assumption is acceptable, but the assumption should not be contradictory to what is already mentioned in the question.
okay ideally speaking you should go for one mark a point but uh, just remember the examiner actually is a bit lenient if you do explain a point very well Okay, uh, so we are now going to move forward and we are going to move on to another question. Uh, hope everyone is okay. Uh, Amarti, if I am actually going to take a break, then we cannot do the second question, unfortunately. So what we could, uh, I just need to ask my web, uh, this uh, coordinator, if I could extend the session by half an hour. If I could extend the session by half an hour, so we can have a 15 minutes break right now, or 10 minutes break. Just, just wait for a second, let me ask him. Uh, okay, so actually uh, let's start off. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Amartya, we can't have a break right now. Uh, let's actually continue the session uh, so that we could have uh, some constructive uh, workings uh, for some time. Uh, now the next question that I'm actually going to move on to is going to be um, So the next question is going to be Okay, it's uh, basically March, June 2017, question number four. March, June 2017, question number four, which is actually a question named uh, Tall Tuck Company. March, June 2017. Now, uh, let's actually start off with this question. Let's just discuss. 
So it is actually March, June 2017. Uh, question number four. Now let's talk about this question tall tuck. It says tall company is a listed company in the building industry which is specializes in the construction of large commercial and residential developments. It says in the construction of large commercial and residential developments. Now says tall tuck company had been profitable for many years but has just incurred major losses on the last two development which it has completed in its home country of Ireland. These developments were an out of town retail center and a major residential development. Tall tax directors have blamed the poor results primarily on recent recession in Ireland. All the demand for the residential development also appears to have been adversely affected by the area and so on, so on, so on. So. Now, it says as a result of returns from these two major developments being much lower than expected, the returns being much lower than expected. Toltec has had to finance current WIP by a significant greater amount of debt finance giving it a higher gearing than most other construction companies operating in Aram land. So the entity has incurred losses and as a result of incurring the losses what has actually happened is the entity uh, uh, finance the debt finance actually enhanced. Now it says Directors have recently been alarmed by a major credit agency decision to downgrade tall tax credit rating from double A to triple B. So there is actually a downgradation from double A to triple B. That's what has happened. The directors are very concerned about the impact this will have on the valuation of tall tax bonds and the future cost of debt. And it says the following information can be used to assess the consequences of the change in the tall tax credit rating. Now it says <coughs> Tall Tuck has an issued 8% bond which has a face or a nominal value of 100 and a premium of 2% on redemption in three years time. So you have a bond which is going to be redeemed in three years time and the bond is going to be redeemable at 2% premium. Coupon on the bond is payable on an annual basis. Government has three bonds in issue. They have a face value of 100 and are all redeemable at par. Taxation can be ignored on government bonds. They are of the same risk class and the coupon of each is payable on annual basis. The details of the bonds are as follows. So if government bond which is one, you've got uh, bond two, you've got bond three and you've got the coupon rate and the market values, etc, etc. And we are also being told that the credit spreads published by the credit agencies are as follows shown in basis points. Now it says the tail tall tax shareholders capital base can be divided broadly into two groups. The majority of shareholders are comfortable with investing in a company where dividends in some years will be high but there will be low or no dividend in other years because the cash demand facing the business. How a minority would like tall tuck company to achieve at least a minimum dividend each year and are concerned about companies undertaking an exit. It says calculate the valuation and yield to maturity of tall tuck's $100 bond under its old and new credit ratings. So we need to calculate the value and the yield to maturity. We need to calculate the value and the yield to maturity. Now what exactly is going to be the value and what exactly is going to be the yield to maturity. So let's actually do talk about it. Now <coughs> the value of a bond is the present value of future cash flow. Discounted using relevant rate. So it's going to be present value of future cash flow discounted using relevant rate. And when we talk to we talk about the yield to maturity, the yield to maturity actually refers to IRR of the bond. So it says calculate the valuation and the yield to maturity of the tall tax hundred dollar bond under its old and new credit rating. So if we talk about it, the value of a bond is the present value of the future cash flows discounted using the relevant rate. And when we talk about the yield to maturity, it's actually the IRR that you need to calculate. Now, how exactly are we going to calculate the value of the bond? Now, what I need to tell you people is the examiner's articles are very important. This question is a replica of one of the old articles that was published by the P4 examiner. And it almost uh, has the same sort of construction the way the article was actually being there. So basically it's important that you go through the examiner's articles also. Anyways, 
So basically what happens is these are the government bonds that are available. So what we need to do is that we need to calculate the yield curve of the government bond using this specific data. What we need to do is that we need to calculate the yield curve of the government bonds using this specific data. Now how exactly are we going to calculate the yield curve? Now Okay, let's talk about it. <coughs> you see, um, we are being told that there is a bond which has a coupon of 9% and a market value of 104%. So what you need to actually understand is that value of a bond is present value of future cash flow. Now, what is going to happen is if I say the first bond, which is bond one, if I say the first bond, which is bond one, so you would say year, you would say cash flow, you would say discount factor, and you would say present value. So you were going to say like this that the bond has a coupon of 9%. Now, what is going to happen is year zero, the bond would have a value of 104. And year one, there would actually be an interest of nine, and there is actually going to be a redemption of 100 in year one. So we need to have a discount factor as R or X or something that is actually going to make this 104 at year zero equal to 109 in year one. So basically, what we can actually do is that, sorry, this 104. In year zero equal to 109. So basically we could write down this equation like this which is 104 is equivalent to 109 into 1 plus R power minus 1 So we could actually say that 104 is equivalent to 109 divided by 1 plus R Resultingly what is going to happen is 1 plus R is equivalent to 109 divided by 104 so you have the R as what so you have the R as 4.8 percent so you have the R as 4.8 percent now what next so what have we done up till now we have simply used the formula of IRR and uh, while using the formula of the IRR what we have simply done is we have simply we have simply calculated the IRR of this bond which is the year one bond now how would we perform the calculation for the bond two? now let's talk about the bond two. the value of the bond two is 102 and 102 is calculated like this year one we have got seven percent which is going to be multiplied by 1.048 power minus 1 plus then you have got 107 and this will be divided by 1 plus r power 2 so let's actually solve about this let's actually solve this so how exactly are we going to solve this we're going to say 1 plus r square is equivalent to So the R is going to be 5.95%. The R is going to be 5.95%. And we'll use this 5.95% for the year 3. So for the bond 3, how will we do it? 
we'll do it this way 98 is equal to 6 divided by 1.048 plus 6 divided by 1.0595 and plus 106 divided by 1 plus r power 3 so let's solve for the year 3 also and see how much is the r Okay, so we have got 6.83%. The resulting, if we summarize, <coughs> we've got the yield curve of the government bond, which is 4.8595 and 6.82 or 6.83, which is rounded off. So, what have we done? We have simply used the information which is available in the question. And on the basis of that information, we have actually calculated the yield curve at the various dates, at the various rates, and Okay, how did we got 1.038? Who is asking 1.038? No, this is not 1.038. This is 1.048 because it's for 4.8% is the rate for the year one. Okay, is everyone okay with the calculation of year one, year two, and year three rates? Okay, now next <clears throat> so basically our questions requirement was actually we were required to calculate the valuation and the yield to maturity so how would you calculate the valuation and the yield to maturity of the bond so let's actually talk about it basically you need to have the relevant yield curves because without the relevant yield curve you can't do it so basically if your credit rating is double a uh, year one year two and year three six point eight two percent 5.95% 4.8% and what we will have is we will add up we'll add up the credit spread with 0.18 because this 18 this 18 actually means this 18 actually means 0.18% so we'll add up this 0.18% here so we'll end up getting 4.98% then we will actually add up this uh, we'll add up this uh, 0.31% here and then we will add up this 0.45% in year 3 so what are we going to get as a result we need to establish Okay, now let's talk. So we have got the year uh, this uh, double A when the credit rating is double A we have got these discounted. So how would you calculate the value of the bond? So if we need to calculate the value of the bond, we would say here we would say the cash flows, the discount factor and the present value. So what is actually going to happen is what is actually going to happen is <clears throat> you'll have this uh, specific bond as uh, we have an 8% $100 bond which is redeemable at 2% on redemption. The bond actually has a life of 3 years. So what is going to happen? What is going to happen is you'll have year 1, year 2 and year 3. So it's going to be 8, 8 and it's going to be 8, 8 and 110. One, Why 110? Because what is going to happen in, in the year 3 there is going to be an 8% interest plus 102 redemption. So this will make it 110. This will make it 110. 
and you'll have the relevant discount rates. What are the relevant discount rates? Uh, <clears throat> the relevant discount rates are going to be like this. Uh, the relevant discount rates we've already established. These are actually going to be 4.98%. Uh, they are going to be 6.26%. And they're going to be 7.27%. <clears throat> So you'll have the present value, you'll calculate the value of the bond like this. Okay, so how much is it? It's 103.8. 103.8. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on this question. I'm not going to waste much of the time, but uh, my objective is actually to discuss the question such that you are able to handle this question on your own. Now, <clears throat> what is actually happening here is, what is actually happening here is, We have established the value of the bond to be 103.8. Now, when is that? When the bond, when the company had a credit rating of double A. If the credit rating went on to become uh, triple B, the yield curve would be different because if it is actually triple B, if the credit rating is triple B, this would become 54, 69, 86 as the relevant basis that needs to be added up or deducted. Now, what next is there? The next situation is going to be. So we'll calculate the value of the bond like that. So we were actually required to do one of them, the valuation of bond. So how would you do it? It's a present value of the future cash flow discounted using the relevant yield curve. Now, we're also required to calculate the yield to maturity of the bond. We also required to calculate the yield to maturity of the bond. Now, how would we calculate the yield to maturity of this bond? Now, let's just understand this thing. As I discussed that the yield to maturity is simply the IRR. Should calculate here, you would have the cash flow, the discount factor, and then present value. Another discount factor, and then present value. You'll have like this. You'll have here zero. Uh, it's going to be 103.8, which is the present market value of the bond. Then year one till year three, we would have an 8% interest. And then year three, where it's actually going to be a redemption of one over. So what you need to do is that you need to use the discount rate on your own. You need to use the discount rate of your own. Uh, and you need to establish the IRR. So um, <coughs> I would suggest that we use a discount rate of 10% first and see what the IRR turns out to be.
uh, Amartya, that is okay if you've used 8% and 5%. I've just used 10% and my answer is basically negative 7.4. So ideally, if you have used 5%, what is the answer at 4, 5%? Okay, it's 6.1 positive. So you can calculate the IRR like this, 5% plus um, 6.1 divided by 6.1 plus 7.4, multiply by 10% uh, minus 5%. The thing, Lee, what does IRR stands at? Okay, at 7.2%. So if the examiner is asking the yield to maturity, so the yield to maturity is the IRR, and what does it tell us? It tells us that if an investor invests in the bond at 103.8 and holds it till maturity, then the return that he's going to achieve is going to be 7.2%. So what does it tell us? It tells us that the return that the investor will get is going to be 7.2%. Is that okay? So basically we had the questions requirement as calculate the valuation and yield to maturity of the tall tech company's $100 bond under its old and new credit rating. So we actually uh, establish it using the old credit rating and you do have an idea that how can you calculate using the new credit rating. It's simple that you have to estimate the yield curve for uh, triple B by using the appropriate credit stretch for the triple B. Is that okay? Okay, so basically I'm gonna keep it till here for today and uh, you can attempt the rest of the parts on the question and what I'm actually going to do is that I'm going to have uh, a question on the business valuations uh, and uh, restructuring which I'm going to take up tomorrow and I'm also going to discuss a few areas of the international investment appraisal a few areas of the restructuring so our session is going to be inshallah covering a lot of areas of the slavers uh, like restructuring uh, mergers, acquisitions real options bond yields etc etc so uh, Amartya I mean I would actually suggest that uh, let's wait till the fourth day of this uh, session and then I'm actually going to discuss the expected question and we can discuss these things in the group also so anyways uh, guys uh, um, I would highly appreciate if you people could share your feedback of the today's session because your feedback is actually a gift for us uh, it helps us learn it helps us uh, uh, learn from the mistakes that we are causing and helps us improve and helps us deliver better uh, and meet your expectation so please uh, do share your feedback so that we can uh, we can actually uh, act accordingly Thank you Najam. Thank you Amartya. Thank you Steffi Abraham. Uh, please others if you could also share your feedback please. Inshallah Iman. <laughs> uh, Omar Yusuf yes will share. Uh, I'm Naimad, I know my writing is very pathetic. That's why I actually went on uh, to attempt the NPV question on the Excel and that's what I will do that uh, to whatever possible extent I can do Excel. I would do that. Uh, so Jadri, what we can do is that I have a plan uh, you join the whatsapp group. I'm actually going to I'm actually going to ensure that I deliver more to you people inshallah The whatsapp group uh, link has been shared on this group only also uh, kindly look into this uh, Please uh, use your uh, Google Chrome so you can uh, connect to the WhatsApp group. Okay, so we'll wait for uh, one more minute. Uh, if you people could actually um, uh, share the feedback, those who want to. 
how to give feedback uh, janet you just write down <laughs> where you are writing this thing i can share your uh, number share your phone number thank you amar thank you iman okay uh, so let's actually meet up uh, tomorrow inshallah uh, till then uh, <clears throat> have a good day and uh, we will actually uh, try and uh, do more and more uh, things so that we can